<coughs> Thank you. Thank you to the Manzanar Committee for inviting me to speak today. I am so honoured, I'm so honoured to be with you all. Um, I'm so honoured to be representing Janum, our leadership, our volunteers, our staff and our members and supporters across the whole country. And it's of course profoundly moving to be with you on this 49th, anniversary, 49th annual Manzanar pilgrimage. And particularly in this year of the 30th anniversary of the American Civil Liberties Act of 1988. <coughs> Silent no more. Liberty and justice for all. At this time, I can't think of a theme that could be more powerful and more urgent and more relevant at this moment when the democracy and the human rights in this country are being threatened and when our obligation to shine a light on what can happen when any community is scapegoated and persecuted could not be more urgent. Over the years before joining the team of Janum, I visited the museum frequently and I was always, I've always been keenly aware of how powerfully the Japanese American experience has resonated with my own values and lifelong commitment to human rights and justice. But it was really only when I joined the staff almost 18 months ago now that I began to fully understand the dedication, commitment, and sheer collective will of an entire community to preserving the legacy and to ensuring that the Japanese American experience is never forgotten and never repeated. I found there were strong similarities and echoes with the path that I've taken in my own life and the values that have driven the choices that I've made. When I was in my 20s in my native South Africa during those very, very dark days of apartheid, I joined the resistance movement to fight for democracy, for justice, and against the policies of racial segregation that were the laws of the land. It was an extraordinarily difficult time that carried enormous uncertainty and enormous fear. We faced police brutality, we faced troops in our townships, Activists and leaders were disappeared and assassinated. And at that time it was routine for activists who were arrested to be tortured. Peaceful protest was criminalized. A gathering like this would never have been allowed because it was not lawful. Journalists were silenced and all political opposition was criminalized. And in 1986, I was arrested, along with thousands of my comrades and fellow activists, and held under emergency laws in indefinite detention without trial. I was held first in solitary confinement um, in a very small police cell in the college town that I lived in. And then finally, I was moved to a maximum security prison and interrogated on an almost daily basis. And it was during that time that I learned that the security police, the South African security police, were building treason charges against me, which carried an incredibly high penalty. Um, the minimum sentence was 10 years, and the maximum sentence was 20 years. If I had not been white, I would have faced the death penalty. When I was finally released, I was issued with a banning order which meant that I could only stay in my geographic location. I was banned from writing. I was, not, I was a journalist. I was a researcher. I was not allowed to write. I was not allowed to speak. I was not allowed to be in gatherings of more than three people. And the most difficult part of it all was that I found myself in another prison, but it was an invisible prison, that I was having to police myself, and my friends were having to police me. We still had to wait several years before Mandela was released and the apartheid laws were overturned. And for me personally, I still had to wait several more years before I was allowed to marry my, my fiancé who was not white because marriage across racial lines was illegal. And now I find myself at Janum. And I'm telling you this story because it's important for you to understand who I am and why I am heading up what I think is one of the most extraordinary and important institutions in this country. Because I find myself at Janam now at this time of incredible divisiveness and uncertainty.
We're once again witnessing the corrosive power of prejudice and discrimination, the return of explicit racism to public discourse, the shredding of truth, and the disastrous consequences of public policy when it's shaped by the politics of bigotry, hatred, and failed political leadership. If you remove the war hysteria, it's, very, it's the very same climate that allowed the Issei and the Nisei to be swept up and imprisoned in concentration camps. It was the same climate that destroyed their communities, their livelihood, and stripped them of their dignity. In the last year, in the last year, certainly and certainly the last year since the, I was at, at Manzanar, we've again seen the stripping of rights. We've again seen the, const the stripping of constitutionally guaranteed rights, which are not privileges that can simply be bestowed or withheld. They're rights that are protected by the Constitution. <laughs> 75 years ago, Americans stood by, silent and complicit, as your parents, your grandparents, and many of you here today were forcibly removed from homes and communities. You were stripped of your rights. It was the self-same prejudice and bigotry that is now spreading like a corrosive stain across this country that made the incarceration possible. Political leaders will change. They always do. And as surely as the sun will rise tomorrow, Trump will not always be president. And the wrongs will be righted. However, he may no longer be president. But what I, and what I fear more than anything else is the climate that he and his ilk have unleashed. It's a climate in which the language of prejudice is again becoming policy in which truth is perverted and racial hatred even makes racial violence permissible. We've seen Charlottesville. We've seen the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists marching. But you know, they can be tamped down. They can be taken care of. But it's at the policy level. It's at the policy level where that is the most pernicious. And that's the most difficult to reverse. We're seeing the criminalization of immigration. We're seeing over 700 children have been separated from their mothers that are seeking to come into this country as migrants or refugees. This country has closed its doors. It's closed its borders to refugees, people who are seeking asylum. 11 Syrians, 11 refugees from Syria have been allowed to come into this country in the last year. The travel bans that we've seen and that may yet still be upheld by the Supreme Court. The, we're seeing again the exclusion and scapegoating of people based on race, religion, sexual orientation and ability. And then most recently, we're seeing how the 20, the plans for the 2020 census, where you have to indicate your citizenship, we know that that's going to be weaponized as another form of exclusion and another way to cement differences and to keep people apart. In the, face of this, in the face of this, none of us can afford to be silent. 75 years ago, only the American friends stood up for Japanese American. Most of the country stood silent in their complicity. I'll never forget Archbishop Tutu saying to us all those years ago in South Africa, if you're neutral in the face of injustice, you choose to side with the oppressor. And he quoted an African proverb, which is, if an elephant has a foot on the tail of a mouse and you say you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> when I look back on my own history, I feel so incredibly proud that I, fla that I flew the flag of revolution, that I was able to be part of a movement that saw the liberation of my country, that brought the promise of justice and democracy and to the end to one of the most oppressive, re oppressive regimes of the 20th century. I was not much older than many of the young people who are gathered here when I started that journey. You know, I'm reminded as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, some of the words that Alan Nishio spoke at the Day of Remembrance at Janum just several months ago, and I thought that they were important enough to read to you. 
because as we hear, as we hear, we at, we at Manzanar, we at this hollow, we on this hollow, this we standing on hallowed ground. We're remembering redress, and he was talking about redress, and he was talking about how extraordinarily, how extraordinarily important redress wa was, and how it lifted the veil of silence. And so many of you have spoken about how your parents and your grandparents didn't speak about their experiences. And he said, it was something that we could talk about and became very important because the feelings of shame and embarrassment turned into feelings of righteous indigna indignation and anger and turned to a fighting spirit that understood that what happened to us was wrong and we needed, the, we needed to do the effort to make it right. That was our community coming together. He also talked about what might have happened to the community if there hadn't been redress how many of the Ise and the Nise who'd passed would have done so without the sense of redemption. So it was an enormous, enormous coming together around a single goal. It was an enormous victory for human rights and it was an enormous victory for civil rights in this community. And it wasn't just the redress. It wasn't just the fact of the coming together, but almost more important, almost equally important, was that it, it, it drew a line in the sand, it, it put a stake in the ground, and one that the American government could not ignore. And they were forced to apologize for the great wrong that they had done. So in South Africa, we had our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which in many ways was very similar. All of us, whether we, white, whether we were white, or whether we were black, or whether we were Indian, we were all less whole because of apartheid. Black people suffered years of oppression, while most white people became less compassionate, and less humane, and therefore less human. There was no redress. There was no redress. But we also stood, we stood with truth, because we were forced to look at the truth, we were forced to confront the history, and we were forced to forgive. Black people who'd been oppressed for hundreds of years forgave their oppressors, forgave their oppressors with such extraordinary generosity of spirit. And if it hadn't been for that, our country would not have been allowed to come to terms with our past. We wouldn't have been allowed to recover our humanity or to imagine a new beginning for ourselves. And I can only guess, I can only imagine that redress must have played the same role for the Japanese American community. We can't forget our past because if we do, or if we try to bury it, we know that we're doomed to repeat it again. You know, I'm going to quote Archbishop Tutu again, and the reason I am, I had the privilege of working with him, but he was so intrinsically central to that forgiveness, that truth and forgiveness and reconciliation moment in South African history. But he has this way with words, which you have to listen to very carefully often to what he's saying to understand the power. But there's one phrase, one phrase that's really reverberated through my mind all these years, and it's, if we allow bygones to be bygones, there will be no bygones, because history will be repeated. So, thank you. I find myself a Janum, and one of, the th one of the great lessons for me has been that Janum has always stayed true to its mission, and it always will. And that's to preserve and share history, to help people draw parallels between the past and today, to inspire our visitors to think critically and act ethically, and most importantly, to stand strong to ensure that no other group is similarly targeted, to learn from history to inform the present and to shape the future. And that's exactly what we're doing now. That's exactly what the work of the Manzanar Committee is. That's exactly the work of what these pilgrimages do. So it's an honor, it's a real honor to stand with all of you. So much of the work that we do collectively is around, is rooted in the issues of democracy and civil rights. The fabric, 
the culture, and the values of democracy. The civil rights that were violated, that have been violated, that still need to be protected. The Japanese American experience is about democracy, about the grave injustice that is committed, about the incredible valor of the, valor of the Nisei soldiers who fought prejudice on two fronts. The almost, the terrible, terrible choice that the no-no boys had to make and that they had to face with courage and that they had to face the consequences with courage. It was also about standing together as one community to fight for redress and to ensure that the Constitution doesn't fail Americans again. And most importantly, you all stood together and you've made the rest of the country learn from your mistakes. I mean, not your mistakes, the mistakes of the, kind of, of the government. But you've, you've also stood as a beacon for the rest of the world who care about justice and who care about huma, human rights and who care about humanity. I cannot tell you how encouraged I am to see all of the young people who are with us today. At the risk of sounding ageist, at the risk of speaking down to you, forgive me if I do, but you inspire me. You inspire me every single day. We're all here. You're here. You're here on hallowed ground. You're here because you've come to remember. You've come to commemorate. But the most important way you can do that is to honor the history of your families, of your parents, of your grandparents, of your great grandparents. And the way that you honor that history is to leave here, is to go out and be active, to participate, to engage. I know that you're here because you do that already. But go out and organize. Protest, be activists. Vote. For goodness sake, vote. You must keep your voices as loud as you can possibly make them. You have to remember that part of keeping your voice loud is to honor the sacrifice of the people came that came behind you. But also remember that we're here, that redress happened because it wasn't just because of a loud voice, but it was because we got, because you got your statements right, you got the facts right. You stood on the side of fact and you had very, very strong arguments. Our collective work isn't done. We'll be much, much stronger if we do it together. And the last thing that I'll say to the young folks who are here, you know, as surely as my generation fought the revolution in South Africa, your generation will lead the resistance and we will win because of you and we will all win because, we'll, because you will stand on our shoulders and we will all win because we have right on our side. Thank you very much.